الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic, exorcism, as was introduced by my brother Yusuf, is one which I personally had difficulty finding out the reality. As a student in Medina, we heard about it. In Riyadh, I heard about it in the 80s, even movies were being made about it from the Western perspective. But the reality of it with regards to Islamic teachings, I was unclear. I heard stories from Muslim communities, but it was all a vague conglomeration of practices, ideas, etc. And because of that, I chose to do the topic of my PhD research on the exorcist tradition in Islam. With the intention of creating a document which would remain as a definitive presentation of the authentic Islamic view on exorcism. Connected to that, of course, was the jinn world. And consequently, the beginning of the thesis, I looked at in the beginning the world of the human spirit, human soul. I looked at the world of the angels and the world of the jinn. Because in human tradition around the world, exorcisms are being performed whether from Hindu tradition, Buddhist tradition, Christian tradition, and other religious traditions. And in each, people had different concepts of where the whole issue of possession was coming from. Hindus, for example, believe that possession came from the spirits of human beings who died tragically. Christians also absorb that thought. Others held that possession was done by fallen angels. The devil, Satan, being the leading figure, that the evil that came in the form of possessing human beings came from that source. And of course there are in the Bible uh, recorded incidents attributed to Prophet Jesus alayhi salam where he drove evil spirits out of people who were possessed. So 
the beginning of the thesis was an introduction to that spirit world, whether the world of the angels, the world of the human soul, and of the jinn. In order to establish accurately the Islamic view on the source of possession. And I show in my thesis, which was published in the UK by Al Hidaya Publishing Company in Birmingham. In the beginning, I established the fact that possession comes from the agency of the jinn. It has nothing to do with human spirits. And it has nothing to do with the angels, the world of the angels. So for us to understand the process of exorcism in Islam, possession and exorcism, we have to understand the world of the jinn for what it is. So I will just briefly run through basic, authentic and accurate information about the jinn to dispel from your minds any fables, fairy tales, stories you may have heard about the jinn. Now, the jinn, we know according to both Quranic verses and statements of the Prophet Wasallam, are made from what we may call an elemental fire or fiery wind. These are terms used to describe the origin. Not that they are themselves fire, but that is their origin. The question that usually pops in people's minds when we discuss this point is, we heard that some of the jinn will be going to hell. So if they're fire, how are they going to be burnt in the fire? That's a question with would come automatically someone's, to someone's mind who understood that some of the jinn will be going to hell and some of the jinn would be going to paradise. Of course, the answer is very simple, that in the same way that we are made from clay, yet if clay is put under fire in a kiln, turned into pottery, you can take that same piece of clay and kill any one of us. Clay killing clay. Because though we are originally from clay, we are not blobs of clay walking around today. Similarly, the jinn, though they came from a fiery origin, it doesn't mean that they are themselves fire. The jinn also die. They don't live eternally, only Allah is eternal. And we are reminded of that in Surah Ar-Rahman, where Allah said, Kullu man alayha fan. All who were in this world, on earth, etc., all of them will pass away. And Satan is from among the jinn. There is some dif difference of opinion about that. 
In Christian tradition, Satan is from the angels. They call him a fallen angel. But in Quranic and Islamic tradition, he is from the world of the jinn. As we can see in the Quran where Allah said, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ and when I said to the angels, prostrate before Adam, they prostrated, all of them, they prostrated except Iblis, Satan. If we stop here, those who say that Satan is from the angels would say, Allah told the angels. So if Iblis wasn't an angel, he shouldn't be expected to bow. The fact that he was expected to bow is proof that he was an angel. But Allah goes on to say, كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ He was from the jinn. End of story. They, those who are insisting on him being from the angels may go into other linguistic arguments, etc., etc., etc. But the text is clear. He was from the jinn. Allah had elevated him to be among the angels, though he was not an angel himself. And that's why he was held accountable to prostrate before Adam. In terms of the jinn, their form is fundamentally invisible to us. So all the stories that you have heard of jinns being human-like and having feet of goats or cow feet, cleft hood, hoof or having eyes like cat's eyes that don't open as our pupils do or other such descriptions and there are many fairy tales about this that I've come across when I was doing my research I went to countries, Muslim countries and Muslim minority countries, etc. I didn't make it here to South Africa, but I'm sure it's the same stories. Um, I heard all kinds of fairy tales. But reality is that the jinn are invisible to human beings. In their natural form, they are invisible to us. We cannot see them. When the Prophet ﷺ was greeted and met with groups of the jinn, the Sahaba couldn't see anything. They were invisible. And Allah Himself in the seventh chapter, verse 27, said, Innahu yarakum huwa wa qabiluhu min la tarawna. He, Satan, and his tribe, the jinn, see you from a location that you cannot see them. You cannot see them. However, there are different forms of the jinn which are forms from our world. It is as if the jinn are in another dimension that is next to us, invisible to us. But Allah has permitted some of them, according to his decision, not that the jinn are capable of doing anything and being anybody, 
but he has permitted some on occasions of his choice to take human form. We know that from the hadith of Abu Huraira and the zakah. It's a long story, but the gist of it is that Abu Huraira was asked to take care of the zakah in the masjid of the Prophet And Satan came to him in the form of a man and sought to take something from the zakah. And he caught a hold of him. And there was a dialogue that went on between them. At the end of that incident, and it was repeated a few times, the Prophet ﷺ informed Abu Huraira that that was a devil from the world of the jinn. And also, in support of the issue that we can't see the jinn, the companions also informed us on different occasions when they saw the Prophet ﷺ in the midst of his prayer reach out as if he was grabbing hold of somebody. And they saw him do it a number of times, but they couldn't see anything. And then later he informed them that a jinn had come at him with a flame to disturb his prayer. And he caught hold of it and had wanted to tie it up in the masjid. But then he remembered the prayer of Prophet Sulaiman in which he asked Allah to give him a dominion which he would not give to anyone besides him. And Allah gave him dominion or power, control over the jinn. That was unique to him. Meaning that the fairy tales that you have heard about so-and-so having a jinn who he sends to do things here, there, and everywhere. He's got control. He can send jinns out after you anywhere you are. Nonsense. <clears throat> In terms of the categories of the jinn, there are three basic categories according to the Prophet ﷺ. He mentioned some that are aerial, that are in the air, that exist in the atmosphere, perhaps between planets, whatever. Those he further described as being able to reach the boundaries of the lower heavens and listen in on some of the dialogue which takes place between the angels, which speak about some things to happen which hadn't or haven't already happened. And they would take this information back down to the fortune tellers who would then be able to predict for human beings the future. So that is one category. There's another category which is con fine to the earth, they are not able to enter in the world between the other planets and the rest of the universe. They may be restricted to particular areas or they may move around. The Qareen, about whom the Prophet ﷺ spoke as being assigned to every human being, falls in that category. And then the third category is that 
of certain snakes and dogs. In the case of dogs, it is the black dog who is completely black. Not black with spots and somewhere here or there, but completely black. That the black dog, the Prophet ﷺ said, is a jinn among that animal world. And he also described certain snakes. For example, in one an authentic narration, he said, Medina has a group of jinn who accepted Islam. Medina al Munawwara has a group of jinn who accepted Islam. So if snakes are seen in homes, request them to leave three times. That's the homes of Medina. After that, kill them because they are probably a demon, a devil among snakes. In terms of their abilities, they eat and drink in their own way. And the Muslims among them, those who came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and had accepted Islam and listened to the Quran from him, he informed them that the bones on which Allah's name was mentioned when the time of slaughter, the time of eating, that the flesh in the other dimension, which would be visible to the jinn and invisible to us, it looks like a bone. There's nothing there. You've eaten everything on the bone. Our eyes cannot see what the jinn are able to see that remains of meat from that world on the bones. So the Prophet ﷺ had told them that any bones, animal bones we're talking about, on which Allah's name was mentioned at the time of eating and slaughter, this would be for the believers from that world. And for their animals, the animals of the jinn, the dung of the animals of this world would be their source of food. Now I know some of you are wondering, okay, what do the animals of the jinn world look like? And you might have heard stories. Again, all of them are bunk. Nonsense. We have no idea of what the animals of the jinn world look like. Were it important, Allah would have informed us through his messenger. So it's not important. Just leave that question. Put it out of your head. Irrelevant. You're never going to see them. <clears throat> they have among them male and female. There are male jinns and female jinns. And we are instructed before entering the bathroom to say what? Bismillah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. In the name of Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evil male and female jinn. Al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Connected with filth. Connected to filth. And included in that are the filthy acts, the people go into bathrooms and write things on walls and other things like that. But we know that the jinn, based on the statements of the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah said in Surah 
الرحمن لم يطمثهن انس ولا جان describing the hur al-ain the maidens of paradise as not having been deflowered by either humans or the jinn. The jinn have free will. They are like human beings, distinctly different from the angels, who have no choice. The angels only do what Allah has commanded them to do. Whereas the jinn, like human beings, have a choice to believe or disbelieve. With regards to their relationship with humans, and this is where things start to get more intimate. Why did Allah tell us about them? Because they do interfere with our world. If they didn't interfere with our world, had nothing to do with our world, then there was no need to inform us. The fact that Allah informed us meant it was important to know how they interact in our world so that we are not mistaken and deluded and then fall into shirk one way or another. So, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had informed us that the jinn can interfere with our dreams. This is something human beings are experiencing all the time. We go to sleep at night and we dream. The Prophet Sallallahu had said there are three types of dreams. One type, which is from Allah. And he explained that these are the true dreams and the good dreams. Good dreams are ones which have good meaning, make you feel good. True dreams are those that you have and they come true. This is a part of revelation that remains after the prophets, the true dreams. And Allah chooses who he gives this form of revelation to. And the fact that you have one true dream or two true dreams or three true dreams doesn't mean now that you start to believe that every dream that you have is a true dream. So you start to tell people this is going to happen and that's going to happen and no, 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 no. No. This is completely in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will only know that a dream is a true dream when it has come true. When it has actually manifested as you dreamt it. That's the only time you can know. Now, the prophets of Allah, based on what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us, began to experience revelation through dreams. This was the starting point. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu started to have true dreams, regularly coming true. And this was the beginning of revelation. You can find that in Sahih Bukhari, etc. The second category of dreams he called sad dreams. Dreams which make you sad or fearful, scared out of your wits. These dreams are from satanic or demonic sources. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that when we have such dreams, we should Keep it to ourselves. Don't go around telling people. Because 
you go around and tell other people, next thing they know, they're having those same kind of dreams too. So just keep it to yourself. The good dreams, you can tell other people, I had this wonderful dream last night. It's okay. That's good. Alhamdulillah. Maybe you'll have a good dream too. But the evil dreams, keep it to yourself. And when the Sahaba came to him, to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with evil dreams, he, ad he ad advised them as such. One occasion, one of the Sahaba came to him and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I had a dream last night in which my head was cut off. And it started rolling and I was running after it, trying to catch it. The Prophet Sallallahu laughed and told him it was an evil dream. Don't tell it to other people. The third category is what he called the ramblings of the mind. You read a book, a detective novel, and next thing you know in your dream you are the detective going about doing these things. We all experience that. You'll be having dreams and people from your past just pop in from here, there, anywhere. It's just like your brain is just releasing things, whatever it came in contact with. So those are the three categories. The one that really concerns us is the dreams from shaitan. This is where satanic forces, demonic forces, can enter into human dreams. And also thoughts. Dreams are in the realm of thoughts. They're connected. And the Prophet Sallallahu had said that Satan, or satanic jinn, evil jinn, will come and say to each of you, or one of you, who created this? And who created that? And who created the other? And then, and who created Allah? Taking you down a road. And of course, when that question, who created Allah, comes, your brain goes, Ugh. ah, you know. Prophet ﷺ said, seek refuge in Allah. When that comes, when that happens, you seek refuge in Allah. Remove it from your mind. Of course, if your child says to you, because you've told him or her, Allah created the trees. Allah created the seas. Allah created the earth. He created, he created, he created. And they say, oh, and who created Allah? Don't say, A'udhu Billah. <laughs> Give him an explanation. If he's reached that point of contemplation that he asked that question, you need to give him or her an answer. Most people will just say, A'udhu Billah. Shut up, don't say that. That's bad. But the correct way is to give them an answer. And you can give them an answer. That no one created Allah. The fact that everything else around you is created by Allah would tell you that if somebody else created Allah, this person is greater than Allah. But we know Allah is Akbar. He is the greatest. There's nothing greater than him. Give them an explanation which will satisfy them. We know that the jinn, in spite of being in that other world, some of them are able to enter our homes. And in particularly, the homes in which 
we don't remember Allah while entering the home. And may participate in our meals when we don't say Bismillah before them. We mentioned earlier that the Prophet ﷺ had told us a, an evil jinn is assigned to each one of us. Just as Allah Taala assigned an angel, some people call the guardian angel. An angel is assigned to each and every one of us, which inspires us, suggests to us to do good. On the other side, an evil jinn is also assigned to us. Suggesting evil, prodding us to do evil. And some illnesses may also be traceable back to the jinn. The Prophet ﷺ said, the plague is from the jinn. And there was an incident with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in which he came home on one occasion and found his wife. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is one of the leading companions, scholars amongst the companions. Anyway, he came home and found his wife Zainab wearing this necklace which was knotted, tied, and the use of knots and ropes, string, is common among those people involved in evil. So he saw her wearing that, he immediately snatched it from her neck and asked her, why is she doing that? She said, her eye was twitching. It was moving involuntarily and it wouldn't stop it was bothering her all day so she went to a Jewish witch doctor in Medina and she asked him for help he prepared this knotted necklace she put it on around her neck and her eyes stopped twitching. So she said, it worked. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, A'udhu Billah. Has the family of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud fallen to this point? Your eye was twitching because a jinn was prodding it pushing it, causing it to twitch. And when you committed shirk by wearing the necklace, it stopped. What is the message in this for us? All the ta'wees, which are given by people who claim to cure you from jinn illnesses, no, it's shirk. Don't wear it. If you are wearing it now, take it off. When people came to the Prophet ﷺ to give bay'ah to him, on one occasion there were ten people who came, he took the bay'ah from nine people and one he didn't. And when they asked, why, why didn't you take the bay'ah from this man? He said, because he's wearing an amulet. And he said, whoever wears an amulet commits shirk. So please know, if you're wearing any, remove it. If you're shy to do it in front of people, when you go home or out of the hall, remove it. It will only bring evil to you. It will not protect you from evil. Even if the people tell you, we, we wrote Quran inside there, you know. We wrote Quran. 
You go open it up, you'll find what kind of Quran they wrote in there. Either they're writing the Quran backwards, or they're writing numbers and, and graphs and tables. Names of the jinn are written inside there also. Believe me, it is shirk. Don't wear it. Get rid of it. This was the advice of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Also, the jinn interfere in our world at the time of our death. That is the time of weakness, the time of our birth. They seek to interfere. And that's why we will learn that the Prophet ﷺ would call the Adhan the time of birth. He did so for Al Hassan ibn Ali. At the time of death, he taught us the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min, a'udhu bika an yatakhabbatan is shaytanu end al maut. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that Satan does not cause me to stumble at the time of my dying. important dua if anyone is dying don't read surah yasin for them surah yasin will not do what you have heard that it does there are no authentic hadiths for surah yasin to be read for those who are dead or dying they're not authentic fabricated. Nor is the hadith that everything has a heart and the heart of the Quran is Surah Yasin. Fabrication. Not authentic. So you can go home and take your Surah Yasin off your walls. Or you can leave it if it's intelligible. As to Surah Yasin written in Arabic you can't read and it's just put up on your wall believing that it's going to protect your home from shaitan. It's not. And that wasn't what the Quran was for anyway. The Quran was not supposed to be wallpaper. Pictures that we put on our walls. And uh, I know you might be thinking, oh man, he's kind of extreme, isn't he? Hardcore, no, not giving us any leeway. <laughs> if you put Surah Yasin on your wall and you have the translation of what it says, and you look at it, reflect on it, think about it, that's fine. It's not from the Sunnah, but it's not haram. But when you're using it in this other way, which is like an amulet, you believe that by putting Surah Yasin on the wall, it makes your home Islamic. Though you might be watching all kinds of movies on TV, you've got pornographic literature in your house and members are, Ahawuz Billah, but you put Surah Yasin on the wall and everything's okay now. This is the point. We have to be real. The deen, the Islam, is real. It's not a game. So, having understood the world of the jinn, we now need to look at possession. In Arabic, it's called as sara. Sara, Sad, Ra, Ain. Sara. We have people who say it doesn't happen. 
The jinn do not possess human beings. They can't. Because this, that, other arguments, logical reasons, so on and so forth. But we have in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 275, those who devour interest, and this is a reminder for all of us who have money in the bank, collecting interest. Those who devour interest, who consume interest, who eat this filth. They will not raise up, get up, except like one who has been knocked down by Satan from his contact with them, coming in contact with them. And we have authentic hadith, like the hadith of Ya'la ibn Murrah, where the Prophet Muhammad was on a journey and he passed by a woman at the side of the road holding a child in her hands. And she approached the Prophet and told him that every day this child was suffering from fits convulsions and it has been repeating itself for some time now the Prophet Sallallahu took the child sat it down in front of him and he opened the child's mouth blew in it three times saying in the name of Allah I am the slave of Allah get out O enemy of Allah now this hadith is clear proof that the child was possessed. If we say no, the child wasn't possessed, then who was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking to? The child? This is clear evidence. We can also find other narrations to that effect. And among the narrations where people came to the Prophet or were taken to the Prophet having these convulsions, etc., which was most commonly associated with possession, was the case of a woman who Ibn Abbas, Abdullah Ibn Abbas, on one occasion, addressed his students and said to them, shall I point out to you a woman from the people of paradise? They said, yes, tell them, who is she? He said, see this black woman? She came to the Prophet ﷺ and informed him that she was suffering from these fits which would knock her down at different points in the day. So she asked him to pray to Allah to remove it from her, to take it away. And the Prophet ﷺ said to her, if you wish, be patient and you will have paradise. Or if you wish, I can pray for you to Allah to cure you. He gave her a choice. She said, I'll be patient. But I become uncovered when I fall down in the fits. When she falls down the fits, cause her clothing to shift and her aura becomes exposed. So she asked the Prophet, ﷺ, please pray that this doesn't happen. 
So the Prophet ﷺ prayed for Allah to remove that from her, the exposure, but left her with the convulsions. Scholars looking at this situation, comparing it to what happened in the other circumstance with Ya'la ibn Murrah, why did the Prophet ﷺ in that occasion open the boy's mouth blowing it, command whatever was within him to get out. But in the case of this woman, he didn't. So Muslim scholars looking at it, deduced from it that there can be medical reasons for that state. That this was not a case of jinn possession, but of some medical imbalance or problem that she had. It was a physical thing, not the jinn. And modern research has shown that doctors treating people with fits identify some as having known origin and others of having unknown origin. And those with the unknown origin have been successfully treated by Muslim scholars who read, recite, etc. for them and it goes away. Where modern science is confronted with that, they can only say, we have no idea as to what went on. Our medicines couldn't cure that individual, or we tried everything. Many cases like that, I've seen it with my own eyes. Medicines make their situation worse. But, Ruqya, proper Quranic, Hadithic recitations cured them, brought them back to normalcy. So the reasons for possession may be identified as medical or the symptoms of possession or from the demonic world. Where it is from the demonic world, scholars from the Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah scholars, have indicated that it seems to happen in some cases out of desire. Desire for power that gives the jinn that may possess an individual a sense of power that they feel good about. Just as in this world, we have people who get off on having power over others, that desire for power. And that it could be connected with some kind of love-related desire. Or it could be mischief. Just as we have mischievous human beings which will do things to create problems for other people from their world, they may engage in mischief, confusion. The third category is possession with the goal of misguidance. Not necessarily misguidance of the person possessed, but the misguidance of those around them. Because when we look at the issue of possession and treatment, exorcism, we see Christians exorcising people possessed in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're cured. We see Hindus treating people possessed in the name of Shiva, 
or Vishnu or Brahma and they get cured. And the Buddhists will do it in the name of Buddha and they get cured. And we even have people calling on the Prophet Sallallahu name saying get out in the name of the Prophet just as the, G the Christians will say get out in the name of Jesus Christ you have Muslims who will say get out in the name of the Prophet in the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get out and that is shirk and they get cured And then we have Muslims following the Quran and Sunnah, treating those cases and they also get cured. So they say, huh, maybe it's all fake. You know, if anything works and everything works, then it must be fake. It's not real. That's one conclusion. The other conclusion is that one way is correct and all the other ways are incorrect. That's what we believe. If we do it according to the sunnah of Rasulullah as he taught us, then it should work. Whereas in the other cases, in the case of the sunnah, the jinn are driven out. The jinn leave not by choice, but they are driven out. Whereas in the other cases, the goal of that possession was to draw people into shirk, to affirm shirk in their beliefs, in their systems. So when the priest says, get out in the name of Jesus Christ, the job was done and the jinn leaves by choice. Because the, what the people see is that somebody was possessed and nothing could cure him but this priest coming and saying, get out in the name of Jesus Christ. Says, Jesus is God. That's proof that Jesus is God. Or the Hindus, in the name of Shiva, Shiva is God. So the shirk has taken place, which is what they sought, and that was enough. They will leave. Maybe they'll come back a few times to reinforce in the minds of the people. But they leave by choice. There is also what may be known as partial possession where the jinn may enter but not take over that individual. And you have people that are called mediums. You come to them and they are able to tell you things about your dead father, relatives. They feed you information and of course, once they tell you a truth, you're finished. They've got you. Because you can't but believe. How could they possibly know this? Reality is that they go into states, they put themselves in states where they connect with the Qareen. Your father's Qareen, which may be hanging around you, feeds information to the Qareen of that medium and they tell you things about your father that they couldn't possibly have known. But when you don't know the process that's going on, it just seems like somebody is in connection with your father. And they will tell you, your father is happy. They can tell you now anything. He is already accepted into paradise. And he has instructed me to tell you to give me a million dollars. He set you up. 
You believe what he said. So now you're hooked. We also know that objects may be possessed. I don't know if you are aware, but back in the 90s, around 95, 1995, 96, something like that, a phenomenon happened around the world. The Hindus, who normally in their puja, their rites of worship, they pour milk on their idols. So on one day, when they were pouring milk, those who were worshiping Ganesh, Ganesh is the elephant head god, the god of good luck for them, Ganesh. And how that god got the elephant's head is funny. Read about it and get a laugh. But this elephant head god, they were pouring milk by its, on its head and that, and they started to notice that the milk was going in the mouth of Ganesh. So they started pouring right in the mouth, and it was, mouth wasn't moving, but it was just absorbing the milk. It happened across India, it happened in the temples in the UK and in the US, one day. Of course, scientists tried to explain that the Ganesh statues, which were made from stone, they had gaps and bubbles that cause what they call capillary action, and it was absorbing the milk. But some of these statues were made from metal. That couldn't explain it. So that possession of Ganesh idols across the world, that was enough to convince people our worship of Ganesh is right. It's real. It affirmed their shirk, locked them into misguidance. And we have a similar story in the case of Prophet Musa and his people when he went to receive the Torah from Allah. He went up on the mountain. After he left a Samiri, and who was a Samiri? Allah knows best. If we needed to know who he was, the Prophet ﷺ would have told us. So all the fairy tales you heard about the Samiri, put them aside. But he was an evil individual, whatever he was, whoever he was. He called the people to gather their gold. He melted it down, and according to him, he threw some dust from the footprint of an angel in the mix. And from that mix, a calf, a golden calf, appeared. And he told the people, Moses' people, you don't have to wait until Moses comes back, Prophet Musa alayhi salam. You don't have to wait till he comes back. Here is the God of Musa right here. Right here, that golden calf. You're looking at this calf. Oh, I don't think so. Then what happened? The calf said, Moo. They all dropped down. That was it. Finished. That was it. How did that happen? The jinn possessing the calf, saying moo. When we consider possession also, 
we have to know that magic falls into the realm. Its sources are from the jinn. And its practice is kufr. Allah said it very clearly in the Quran, وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Teaching magic or practicing magic is kufr. And this doesn't mean if somebody does a little hand trick and pulls a coin from behind your ear, you say, ah, kafir. No, no. <laughs> you know. It doesn't mean every little trick that somebody might do. These are just, you know, slay of hands. But when they're engaged in real magic, and there is real magic, then to do so involves kufr. So, we know that it is real from the agency of the jinn because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was affected by magic. This is in Sahih Bukhari. He was affected by magic. And Particular verses were revealed, the last two chapters of the Quran, in order to overcome that magic. They're known as the Mu'awwadatain or Mu'awwadatan. And if we move on to exorcism itself, and time is now running out. Uh, I will just briefly, since time does not allow us to go into further detail, this is a big topic. I will just identify for you the prophetic method of exorcism. And it's enough to say that anything which does not fall under that category, know that it is dangerous, stay away. The first step is to undo the charm if a charm is connected to it. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu had Ali ibn Abi Talib do. When he was informed where the charm was, he went, took it apart, took the strands of hair that had been tied into knots apart and recited the Mu'awwadatan and that cured the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know from the Prophet Sallallahu practice that he would address the spirit and command it to leave. The third way is through Quranic recitations and Hadithic recitations. As a whole, we call them Ruqya. The authentic Ruqya involve Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, Al-Baqarah, the last two verses of Al-Baqarah, the Basmala. Added to that, we have the Adhan and the Iqama. And all of these have evidence from the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, statements of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, or from the Sahaba clarifying. We don't have time, I'm sorry, to be able to go through all the details of the methods. But enough to say that Aisha reported that whenever any of the household of the Prophet ﷺ fell ill, the Prophet ﷺ used to blow on them while reciting the Mu'awwidat. So we know, somebody's ill, do it. It may be medical, 
or it may be from the world of the jinn. Either way, you do it. And also seek medical care. In the case of the Adham, we know that Abu Huraira conveyed to us that the Prophet Sallallahu had said, whenever the Adhan is made, Satan runs away. Whenever the Adhan is made, Satan flees. And he passes wind to try to drown it out so he doesn't hear it. In terms of Ruqya, I will just mention one out of many. Bismillahi yubrik, Prophet Sallallahu taught us to say. In the name of Allah, may he heal you. Wa min kulli da'in yashfik, and cure you from every ill. Wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad, and from the evil of the envious. Wa min sharri kulli the ayn, and from the harm of the evil eye. So, those ruqa, those incantations which were prescribed by the Prophet ﷺ, these are the ones that we should find out, know them, and use them. We don't need to go beyond the sunnah to various other acts and practices, etc. We don't need to go there. There is plenty in the sunnah to help us. And he also prescribed ajwa dates, Medina ajwa dates, to protect one from magic, jinn related, and poison. And he also recommended truffles. You need to go to Google and find out what truffles are. There are some truffles which are candy made from chocolates, not that. And he also prescribed bathing in the water that drops from the limbs of one who you feel may be the source of harm coming from the evil eye, Ayn. As to the practice of beating, and we have some narrations which indicate that the Prophet ﷺ on some occasion beat severely some who were apparently possessed. But the fact of the matter is those narrations are not authentic. The fact that some later scholars may have acted according to those inauthentic hadith don't make them evidence for that practice. We have Muslims in different parts of the world beating people almost to death. And actually to death. In the UK some years back, in the 90s, one peer there beat a young girl to death. After feeding her red pepper, starving her from not being able to eat anything, using an ashtray, a big glass ashtray, and beating her on her chest so much she had how many broken ribs and horrendous death in the name of exorcism. And in Egypt, also, a few years back, it's occurring in different parts. Know that this is not a part of exorcism. And the last point I'd just like to make given our limited time, that in most cases, it's women who seem to be possessed. Some men get 
possessed, but it seems like it's very rampant amongst women. This is all over the world like this. And from my research with those people involved in exorcism, and please note that I'm not an expert on the subject. I'm not an exorcist. So please don't try to get my phone number and call me to help out, okay? I, I just did an academic research. I observed, I made notes, I wrote a thesis. The point is that most of the exorcists that I've spoken to who claim to be treating by Quran and Sunnah, they said unanimously that real possession is rare. Real possession is rare. And even the Christian exorcists, they say the same thing. It's rare. Real demonic possession is rare. 10 or 15 percent of the cases that come to them. The vast majority are psychological. And that's why you have people who are claiming that they are jinn catchers, you know, ghostbusters. They go to hunt down the jinn and catch them and capture them, burn them and all kinds of things, you know. They will take somebody who will come to them and, you know, and they say, oh, the jinn is coming and it's in your foot and your foot starts to twitch. And then they'll chase it up the foot, up the side, up to the head and they get the strand of your hair and they cut it off, put it in a bottle and set it on fire. And when it happens, you... You feel it. You feel that something has gone. Psychological. This is psychological. It's not real. You know? Auto-suggestion. People fall for this all the time. It's not real. But the big danger, as I said, because so many of those who are afflicted or appear to be afflicted are from women, is abuse. Because you have charlatans, quacks, etc., who claim that they are this and that and have these powers and that powers, and then women come to them and then they abuse them. Then they abuse them. So any of these people who claim to be treating you and they are putting their hands on you know this is abuse. Because the Prophet had said, for a man to touch a woman who he can marry, it would be better for him to have an iron spike driven in his head. So don't accept physical, sexual abuse in the name of exorcism. Women fall prey to this all over the world. So this is a warning. You husbands, relatives, you make sure you are present whenever anything is being done. And if you see anything funny, you know, stop it right away. Get out of there and get as far away from those individuals as possible. Barakallah feekum. I will stop here. We'll give you a chance to ask some questions if we have any time. You know, this is a big topic. I'm sorry. You know, um, I did what I could. And hopefully, inshallah, you have received some clarity because that's what the idea is. It's not about trying to set up shop. Hmm? Start a new business in uh, Cape Town. Inshallah. <laughs>